stuff, you know, like, oh, this studio is struggling to finish the game, they need to finish up some of the stuff, they need some help. Um, let's see who we can get, you know? And um, the interesting part of it is probably unlike most of you, uh, I never came from a programming background. Um, I used to make robots at USC. Um, so it was it was an interesting transition for me, and I think probably Mike still remembers mm -hmm. how I was speaking to him and stuff like that. Um, so the semester I got my job was the first time I was even I even knew how to create a socket. So that was me, um, like six years back. And coincidentally, today I celebrate my sixth anniversary in Activision. And I thought like this would be like the perfect tribute uh, to come back and give a talk about networking. Um, and after being a shipping specialist for almost four years, um, the last two years I've been like full time in Treyarch, um, in charge of Black Ops One and Black Ops Two. Um, if you uh, like or hate theater mode, uh, I'm the one who wrote it. Um, you can hate me for uh, making a, con uh, a consolidated version of theater mode and modern mode. Uh, a lot of people hate that. I know that, and the studio requirements are different. Um, and after that, in Black Ops 2, my entire focus went towards like any of the social online interactions. So, namely like esports, like podcasting, live streaming. Um, all this other stuff. Um, so, as you can see, like I kind of shifted more towards like what are user-created <coughs> content, you know. And if it's user-created content, it's going to be heavy on the network uh, for sure. Uh, nothing comes cheap. So, and, and of course, like the highlight reel from uh, Black Ops Two. I don't know if you guys have used it. Uh, that was actually a small research of mine, uh, purely designed and developed by me. Um, kind of conceptualized also, because I'm still one who owns the demo. So uh, it was a very interesting research. Of course, it's a topic for some other day. So um, anyway, um, before I actually start, um, how many of you have actually made a network here? Nice. So the people who didn't raise their hands, this is more for you uh, in that aspect, because it's going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, and for the people who made network games, uh, this can give you some uh, really interesting insights uh, of um, how to how things are, uh, how things in the networking world work. Um, so, kickstarting the next gen is awesome, right? So every every five six years we say, oh yeah, we got new consoles, like oh better graphics, more processors, more everything, you know. Like everything is improved, including a 400 milliampere increase in the controller batteries, right? <laughs> but the interesting thing which you can see, like all these improvements, can can and and the the regular notion for anyone in the world is, oh shit, that means PS4 is going to be awesome. Like I'm going to see more graphics, more things explode, more things happen, right? But what happened here? The networking, not so much, unless you're Mike Zeta and you have Verizon on Firefox, right? Because most of our internet connection sucks. Maybe because it's Time Warner, maybe it's AT&T, maybe it's anyone else, right? But, so you can see, as much as how much of an increase with processor and RAM and everything was happening over, over these years, it's been like very much less. And the worst thing is, even though you find, and, and, the, and the bandwidth up is what really matters, and that is probably not improved that much, right? And this was a kind of challenge when we were doing like live streaming and stuff. We need to determine how do we send this big video data to the, through the queue, right? So, and then, of course, like we need to account not just for the US, like Australia, like all around the world, right? So, it will vary, so you need to, have a bare minimum. It's just like running a PC game with minimum spec, right? And that's what happens with networking, right? So it's always a challenge to actually represent the entire world and still send it across the network in a way where it doesn't feel weird. We'll touch a lot of different topics like that. A um, lot of even the gripes of Call of Duty, you know? Like. So these are the topics which I'm going to cover today. 
Uh, so for people who have never done any networking game, this, the, the whole purpose is to give you an insight of what would be a good way to build or how do you make decisions you know, of what data you send. Um, so starting with peer-to-peer -peer or client server, right? So the interesting thing is peer-to-peer -peer is probably the most simplistic approach. Uh, very few games use at this point because of all our routers and NAT and all this other crap. Um, so it is very simple. And what it would mean is that I'm going to send a series of commands to you in a very much orderly fashion. Right? So like I for moving from point A to point point B, you say okay, A to like A plus two, and then you, you keep increasing and it's a sequence of commands. Um, it's still used in RTS games. How many people still play Age of Empires? I know Indians play. I know Indians <laughs> play. <laughs> because I still play. So uh, any of these RTS games, the old school RTS games which are kind of dying at this point. Uh, each of it used P2P connection. So what it would mean is that since it's a it's a it's a series of commands, you have to wait till the other person has actually played the turn, right? So if you play a board game, for example, it's perfect to have it in easy in, in, in peer to peer, right? Because you have to wait till you throw the dice because you need to wait till till the other player actually finishes his turn. Which is fine. And in RTS games, it works in that way. And the thing is, you don't, uh, you don't look for this real-time instinctive changes happening. So you you move a character, and the character will keep trying to destroy this building. You know? um, so, but the but the big problem is that the game can be in synchronous fashion only if all the players receive the same commands in the sequential fashion, right? And what that would mean, and you would have probably seen in a lot of these RTS games, is that there is no hot join. So if you play a game, and especially people who play Age of Empires in, in Hamachi networks, will bump into all these problems where like, one player has a bad connection, he drops out, and then the game immediately dumps like a, a small file which represents the world, right? And for him, to again join you and play the game or even continue from where it was left, you need to go back, set up your lobby, and then load this file, and then everyone joins in and the, the same file is sent. So that means everyone's state of the world is again the same, and then you kickstart the game, right? So game synchronization can happen only if everyone is there from time zero, uh, which actually can work in a lot of games, um, like including uh, like for example, like uh, we had the issue with zombies, right? Uh, in world in world at war and uh, yeah, world at war, where like you cannot join a zombies game in between because it's just too expensive. Um, so that could happen. And then there is this notion of client server, and this is primarily the model which is used in most games at this point, uh, where the client keep, like you you are the client, you keep sending your input commands, boom 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 boom. And then the server says, OK, I got this command, I got this command. Let me decide what happened in the game, right? So the game is server of our data. And the client's goal is just to send the inputs as well as just visualize the world, right? So server processes the outcome, server is authoritative. So server says, you killed this person. And everything happens, right? Like, client doesn't do any of that logic. But then the problem is that it gets more complicated, right? Because when you have multiple clients, and how do you decide which client was correct, which client was wrong, where the clients are positioned, it's, it's, it's difficult. And of course, like, internet, right? Any, anytime you, if you play LAN games, fine. But then if you're in your home with a crappy time or internet connection, you will bump into all these other problems, right? So these are the two different uh, things. But just keep a, keep a note that, the same architecture, client server, can still be used for single player. So by that, you are running both the server and the client in the same machine, but you are treating it as a different machine, right? So what it allows you to do is that if you find that it is too uh, processor intensive for the server and the client to run at the same time, what you can do is you can take the server and put it in, in some other place. You can make a dedicated server and then the client will still work as needed. 
Um, there have been t times where, when we were doing like uh, games on Xbox 360 and something which was too computationally expensive, we used to do something called the peak over the wall. You know, so what that will do is that the client who runs the server will not send the message in a loop back. The, the client will just access the memory directly, so that it doesn't need to process any of that uh, from the server line, right? So these are the two different models which you can take. Um, and the interesting thing is, uh, you can take the peer-to-peer -peer almost like an event-based system, uh, where you have a sequence of events, and each event decides the outcome of the other, right? Well, the client server is kind of robust in that aspect, where it can handle any kind of uh, different situations. So let's leave this aside for now, because we'll come back to this again. Uh, and let's go to decide whether we're going to use TCP or UDP, right? Uh, so how many of you are really clear about TCP and UDP? Kind of almost all. Good. So, so I'm, I'm going to rush through this, OK? So it's going to be very easy to use. Uh, the reliability of the TCP is built in. So you don't need to handle any of this noise, right? Uh, and at the same time, it's going to be sent in the sequential order. So if you miss a packet, it will get retransmitted, and then the packets will be processed. The packets after that will be processed later, right? So very, very easy. You don't need to worry about anything in the world, right? And the good thing about it is that it's ordered, and the mechanism itself splits it into packets uh, of different sizes, right? Which will make it easy to transmit. That means. You don't need to worry about fragmenting it or waiting for that packet or any of this stuff because it will fragment it, it will send it, and then it will accumulate everything, and then you will be able to use it, right? And it also is flow controlled, so everything is in sequence. And if we go to UDP, it's, it doesn't have any concept of connection. It doesn't have any concept of reliability. So that means the packets can be duplicated, the packets can be lost, and at the same time, it doesn't split the packets into, into small fragments, which will mean that you will have to do everything manually, right? And since there is nothing, uh, and, and so that means you will have to control the data rate, because uh, in TCP, like it will, it will gather everything together and then send it at once, based on however your router handles it, right? And then packet loss, of course, I've already mentioned, right? So out of these two, which is the best thing to choose? Easy, right? Perfect, because everything is done for us. Why, why, why go and try to build your own, your own computer when you can get it from uh, already packed, right? It's almost like that. But then the problem is TCP is the most bad thing to use in any network. Uh, why? Uh, so and before that, there's a joke here. I hope <laughs> People who know about it understand that. Uh, so, UDP is never reliable. So if I tell you a UDP joke, you might not get it. Yes. <laughs> so why is TCP bad? So TCP is bad just for these, the following, right? So what happens if you send really, really small packets? What the, the system will do is that it will buffer till it reaches a particular size before it decides to send it, right? And what that would mean is that if you are if you are waiting for a command, like it will never reach you till the, the router decides to send it. Right? You can fix that with a flap. So you can say, oh yeah, I can fix this. No? But that's not the only thing, right? The other problem is that if there is any packet loss, which happens in, in the regular world, right? What it would mean is that you will have to wait for it to be retransmitted. So it's as simple as Say I forgot my slideshow today, and I drove down from Santa Monica, right? I drove down, I came here, and then I decided, I found that, oh, I didn't bring my presentation, right? Now I have to travel back again, and then come back here, which means the entire game is going to just wait till that happens, right? Which is not good for the game. The other thing, and, and that's the big reason why you can never be, never use this for shooters. Right? Because even with using UDP, you know how much lag there is. Right? And we will, we will deal with lag very soon. Uh, so this can be used for like turn-based games. RTS still use it, surprisingly. Uh, some uh, MMOs also use it. Uh, because 
the thing is you don't ex you don't find any difference because even if there is a retransmit and if say it takes like 500 milliseconds it doesn't matter because your character is still animating and like trying to destroy it right so it doesn't it doesn't make that much of a difference and so UDP wins right and so at that point if UDP is going to win what you have to do you have to build a reliability logic within the UDP to actually make it functional right but at the same time like since you, you there is no flow control right and there is no fragmentation logic built in that means you have to pack the data efficiently in a way where you are not sending too much too many packets but at the same time you are not bloating the size of a single packet right and this is the worst thing you can ever do in networking. Which is to say, oh yeah, let me uh, move all the game logic in TCP so that the game uh, handles everything correctly, but then let me send all the inputs as UDP because I want it to be reaching the server quickly. Uh, never helps. Because all the routers have their own mechanisms to handle these things. And it never works out properly. And the other problem is at that point, you, are, you have the headache of determining which is important, which is important, the game sending the logic of what's happening in the game or the client sending its actual input so that the game can be processed. Like both are important, so what do you do now? So you'll eventually what will happen is you'll again shift all the logic from UDP and put it in TCP and then it will be functional. So, so if we are using UDP, then what do we do? We need to pack data very efficiently. Uh, and this can be really, really tricky, and that's where uh, probably like every student, uh, including me when I was a student, uh, bumped into the same problem, right? So what will happen is you play inside the lab, you have a server machine here, and then you load your game, everything is gold. You know, and you feel like the game is lag free, see how quickly it reacts, you know? And then what happens? Uh, Zyda says, oh no, the demo day is not happening in in uh, this uh, classroom, it's happening in Sigma school, right? <laughs> and then the server is